See? Okay. So, um, so as I said, asynchrony is uh, one of those topics around gifted education that I think is really one of the key things to understanding our gifted kids. Whether you're a parent or an educator, if you're working with gifted kids and, and um, you may not know this term, but if you've worked with or been around or been raising gifted kids, you certainly have experienced this. And so tonight we're gonna talk a little bit about what this means, uh, what it means for parenting, what it means for school um, and, and what, what it means for your child's experience of growing up. I love this quote from Jim Delisle. He's one of the uh, leading um, writers and educators in gifted education uh, for a long time. Um, and he says simply that our kids are normal. They just aren't typical. And certainly we see that the way that they grow and develop is just not typical. Um, I love this, uh, Stephanie Tolan, who has written a book, I've got the um, reference for it at the end of this presentation, um, about specifically about asynchrony and gifted kids, which I think is probably the best thing out there around the idea of asynchrony. She's been writing about and studying and thinking about asynchrony for many, many years. She writes this, um, and, and this is a, a, using an example of a really extremely gifted child, but I think it applies to gifted kids in general. In terms of development, chronological age may be the, the least relevant piece of information to consider. So take Kate with an IQ score of 170. She might be six years old, physically, but she has a mental age of 10 and a half. That's just the kind of the way that IQ equates. Unfortunately, like every other highly gifted child, she's an amalgam of many different developmental ages. She might be six when riding a bike, so that's doing something physical. 13 while playing piano or chess, something maybe where she's got some real gifts. Nine while debating the rules. If you've got a gifted child, you've probably got somebody who loves to negotiate and debate with you. Eight, while choosing hobbies and books, because it needs to be something that relates to her experience as a six-year-old, as well as uh, her you know, interests intellectually. And five, or maybe even just three, when asked to sit still, or maybe when she doesn't get her way, or maybe when she doesn't win a game. Um, so you know, the question, how can such a child be expected to fit into a classroom designed around norms for six-year-olds? Um, and that's really the question that we're going to be exploring tonight. All of our kids um, who are gifted, are there are differences between their intellectual development, their physical development, their emotional development, their social development. Those are all on different trajectories, and any of them can be ahead or behind. And even within their intellectual development, um, depending upon where their strengths and weaknesses are, they may be way ahead in some things and not so far ahead in other things. And that tension that that can create can make it really difficult um, as parents and as educators to support these kids. But you know, particularly for the kids themselves, it can be a stressful situation to be able to manage being all those ages at the same time. So think about the gifted child or children in your own life, or maybe even yourself. Think about the ages and stages that you might be noticing or have noticed. Um, think about how for your experience that has made potentially parenting tricky um, or, or if you're an educator, maybe education tricky and, and think about how that, uh, that asynchrony might then impact school success, particularly if your child is in a school setting that's not designed to, um, to meet all of those different needs. Um, one of the things I think it's important to say right up front is that a typical educator, even with all the best, you know, most love for their children and best intentions, typically does not have training in gifted education. It's not a, a part of typical uh, teacher education programs. And so oftentimes we see um, teachers who, uh, you know, who may really want to do the best thing for their kids but are sort of measuring their child, their, their children or trying to support their children based on either grade level or age level expectations for typically developing kids that may or may not fit their gifted kids um, or misunderstandings or myths about gifted kids um, and, and that can impact decision making and, and not always for the best. And so 
Um, understanding your child and the way they're learning and growing is really an important part of being able to advocate for your child and making sure they can get what they need. So I'm curious, Emily, you can see the chat. I can't right now because I'm screen sharing. Um, has anything come up in the chat in terms of things that people are seeing or does anybody have any uh, thoughts about some of the asynchrony that you see in your own children that you might be interested in sharing, Emily? We don't have any questions yet. Okay, well, people, I need you to, I, I want this to be a conversation. I don't want to just talk at you here. But you can you can think about it and we can come back to it. Um, so I want to start from the place of how, how I look at gifted education and how we at Seabury School look at gifted education. There's sort of two camps in gifted world. Um, the tr sort of traditional camp, um, the camp that dictates often the way a lot of gifted programs are developed is what's sometimes called the talent development model or the eminence model. And it basically defines giftedness based on the child's performance, based on the things that they do, based on the things that they achieve, based on the things that they accomplish. Um, in that model of giftedness, if you aren't getting straight A's, top of your class, eminent in your field, then doesn't matter really what your IQ is or how you developmentally might be different, you're just not really gifted. You're just, we're just about trying to get you to produce at a high level. Um, for those of us that come at gifted from a child-centered perspective, and that perspective tends to come out of the field of psychology, we look at giftedness as a developmental difference. Just like at the opposite end of the IQ scale, you have kids who are developmentally delayed, who may have uh, you know, educational, emotional, social needs that are different from typical kids because of a delay in their development. Our kids are developmentally ahead in, in one or more ways. Um, if you look at the sort of bell-shaped curve that that uh, IQ falls on, um, the gifted range starts at about two standard deviations above the mean. Um, if you looked at a student that was two standard deviations below the mean with an IQ of 70, people wouldn't typically question that they might need some different considerations in the classroom, that they might need some different considerations in parenting. But when we flip to that other side, oftentimes we think, oh, well, you know, they're bright, they can handle things themselves. Um, you know, th they make good helpers for the other children. Um, and that's really just not true. And, and asynchrony as we get into it tonight, I think will help you see why that's the case. So that means that we don't look at gifted as just a school thing or something that you can outgrow. It's not an award, it's not an achievement, it's not an honor. Uh, it, it, it's really just a way of being, a way of learning, a way of experiencing the world. And to get into that, I want to look at a couple of definitions of giftedness that are um, that mean a lot to me. Um, and again, if you have thoughts or comments or questions, feel free to drop them into the chat as we go along. This is probably my favorite definition of giftedness. It's the one that our school tends to quote when we talk about what we mean when we talk about gifted kids. Um, this comes from Anna, Anna Marie Roper, who was the founder of the Roper School. It was the first school for gifted kids in the United States. Um, and she was one of those those pioneers in the field who really saw that there were these kids that not just couldn't just learn faster or or um, think about things that other kids couldn't think about, but there was really other differences in terms of how they were growing and developing. So she defines giftedness as a greater awareness, a greater sensitivity, and a greater ability to understand and transform perceptions into intellectual and emotional experiences. And that underline is mine, but I think as we go through this tonight, I want you to pay attention to this doesn't just impact kids' intellectual growth and development. It really has a plays a big part in their emotional growth and development. And, um, and if we're not paying attention to their asynchrony, it can create some real emotional challenges for our kids as they grow. Um, this one uh, comes out of a, a group that uh, uh, that I've been working with and facilitating since the um, since the pandemic started. There's a group of us who are uh, who either are running schools or programs from a child centered perspective, or who have been leaders in the field of child centered gifted education for a long time. And Rosemary Cathcart, the author of this particular quote, is one of those folks. We worked for almost two years to put together a document sort of outlines 
how we define child-centered gifted education, what it, what the implications are for kids, for schools, for educators. And, and this was one of the definitions that we included in that document. Rosemary is out of New Zealand. She runs a center that trains teachers in uh, doing child-centered gifted education for students in New Zealand. Um, and she says, giftedness is grounded, grounded in the extraordinary intensity with which with with which gifted individuals experience life. If you know a gifted child, you probably know an intense child. If, if um, in, in my mind, that's probably the word that best defines our kids. Our kids are different in all kinds of ways, but intense is, is something that they tend to have in common. Um, she goes on, uh, such intensity makes possible, whoops, Let's go back. Such intensity makes possible the exceptional qualities and abilities which characterize giftedness. Um, so that intensity allows them to take in all that information and make all the connections that they make and understand the things they understand and see the things that they that they see. Um, in childhood, such exceptional qualities and abilities profoundly shape the child's developmental and learning needs. In adolescence and adulthood, exceptional qualities and abilities can lead to a, a life vision, creating a sense of purpose larger than self, the ultimate outcome of a gifted life. So, so in, in, as Rosemary talks about giftedness, she's talking about, you know, being able to see things that others don't see, to uh, think deeply about things that other people aren't thinking about. And when that is allowed to grow and happen and develop in a child, um, as they move into adulthood, can create this bigger sense of purpose and this bigger sense of meaning um, that can really be powerful for that individual and and make them a, a, an important contributor in the in the community. So that's what we want to support the development of. Here's another um, quote that I I really like that I think helps get at what giftedness is all about. This is from Michael Piahovsky, who is. Um, if you come back on March 26th, and I promise I'll be on time that one. <laughs> um, if you are here on March 26th, I'm going to be doing a second presentation on intensities. Um, and that's probably the two things that I think are most important to understand in understanding your gifted child is the idea of asynchrony and the idea of overexcitabilities or over intensities comes out of a, a, a understanding of how Human development happens um, that was developed by uh, a guy named Dabrowski, Kazimir Dabrowski. And um, Piachowski is one of his students, and he's really taken the idea of these overexcitabilities or overintensities that we see in some of our kids, um, taken that into, into what we see in gifted uh, education development. So uh, Piachowski says giftedness is not a matter of degree, but a different quality of experiencing. So it's not just you know, that they go faster or they get things quicker, but it's a different quality of experiencing. And I love the terms he used here, vivid, absorbing, penetrating, encompassing, complex, commanding, a way of being quiveringly alive. When you think about our kids' incessant need to know why and how, and the, the questions that sometimes delight us and sometimes drive us crazy, um, this is what Piachowski is talking about here. Um, this different quality of experiencing. I read once a, a death or a description of gifted people, gifted kids, and it talked about, you know, if all of us are seeing the world through different lenses, it's like a gifted person is seeing the world through a microscope and a highly gifted person is seeing the world through an electron microscope. So we're all looking at the same thing, but we're not seeing the same thing. And, and for our kids, that can be a beautiful thing when they make connections that other people aren't making or they see things that other people aren't seeing, but it can also be challenging when you then can feel really misunderstood or not heard or not um, uh, appreciated, I guess, in some ways. And the last definition that that uh, I think is important here is comes from a group called the Columbus Group. The Columbus Group was formed back in the 1990s when, in like I said, in gifted land, there's this there's this tension back and forth between is gifted just what you know your performance, what you can do, or is it who you are? And the community was sort of moving in this talent development way of thinking about giftedness, and there were a group of um, women leaders in gifted education who said, this isn't, we don't believe this, this isn't, we don't support this. 
And they happened to be in Columbus, Ohio, and they gathered together and they wrote their own definition of giftedness around the idea of asynchrony being the central thing that makes a gifted person unique um, and, and really defines giftedness. And, um, and this has come to be a really critical definition uh, of giftedness in this child-centered approach to gifted education. So giftedness is asynchronous development in which advanced cognitive abilities and heightened intensity, which we've talked about a little bit, combine to create inner experiences and awareness that are qualitatively different from the norm. This asynchrony increases with higher intellectual capacity. So the greater, the higher the IQ, the greater the asynchrony. This uniqueness, uh, the uniqueness of the gifted renders them particularly vulnerable, and we'll talk about that more later on, and requires modifications in parenting, teaching, and counseling in order for them to develop optimally. Um, you can imagine, you know, when you have this, this disparity between your intellectual development and your emotional development, for example, without the right support in place, you can be vulnerable to, um, you know, to existential depression, to, to all kinds of challenges as you're trying to be heard and understood and just process the world around you. So I'm gonna stop there for a minute. Are there questions or comments so far? And then we're gonna kind of dive more deeply into what asynchrony looks like and how we support these kids. Any questions at this point? I don't see any in the chat. Anybody have a question you wanted to throw in there? Okay, I'll go right along then. All right, so what's asynchrony? So obviously asynchrony, out of sync, uh, it, it means that the child is many ages at the same time, but it's more than just that. There was an author quoted one time that said, I wish my child had a digital readout on their forehead that could tell me what age I'm dealing with right now. Because our kids jump back and forth between the ages and stages that they are. And I think it's important to say up front here too, that asynchrony doesn't just apply to little kids. Sometimes it can be most evident, most easy to see in our youngest kids. For example, when we get a four-year-old in our preschool program who's got this huge story in their head that they would like to write when it's creative writing time, but are still learning how to form letters, um, that physical ability to do the writing and that intellectual ability to create the story can create attention there. And so that's an easy thing to kind of see and get your head around. But we see it with older kids too, and even adults, where your ability to conceive of what's going on and your emotional maturity and your life experience um, sort of limit your ability to process that. And we'll, again, we'll come back to that a little bit more as we go along. Um, so what we're talking about with asynchrony is that, the, like I said, the intellectual, the academic, the social, emotional, and physical development are all on different trajectories. You'll hear me talk about intellectual development and academic or um, and academic, I guess, development is, is probably the most common or cognitive and academic development um, as different things because they are. My ability to think about big ideas, my ability to problem solve, my ability to understand abstractions, my ability to, to um, make connections, that's my intellectual ability. That's my ability to process information, my spatial reasoning ability, my ability to conceive of something, you know, and, and see what it might look like, you know, in, in spatial terms or, or picture things. Um, that's intellectual ability. Academic ability, the ability to produce academic work may or may not correlate to intellectual ability. You might have a student who's intellectually very advanced, but academically their ability to produce work, you know, to write, to read, to, to, get the you know the right answer to math problems may be it may be right there with it but it may be behind for a variety of reasons it may be that the child um has some you know physical limitations because of their age you know if their intellectual ability like we're talking about here is way ahead of their physical ability it may be that the um the things that they're learning about in school don't grasp their interest and so they are 
unwilling to put the effort into the academic work because they just don't see it as relevant. And so, so we talk about those things separately because they really are, are different. And, and like I said, you know, when we look at it from this perspective, we're really looking at your intellectual development ability and your emotional and social development. Your academic ability may be at those, those super high levels, but it may not be for a variety of reasons. Um, being asynchronous means being out of sync with yourself, but it also means being out of sync with your age mates, with expectations at school, and sometimes with expectations at home. Um, uh, you know, if you talk like, like a much older kid and you're a younger kid, it can be easy for the adults around you to base their expectations on you for you on how you verbalize things and forget that you are really much younger than you sound. And that can be tricky. And we'll come again, we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, asynchrony impacts both the inner and the outer experience of the child. So it impacts how they feel about themselves internally and the sort of tension that they have within themselves. And for different kids, the level of that tension or that level of that asynchrony is different. Um, and also, like I said, the higher the IQ, the greater the asynchrony and the greater that that, that tension or that pull might be. Um, it also impacts the outer experience of the child. So it impacts how they're treated by others, by peers, by adults. Um, you know, I honestly, back in the days when I taught in public school a long time ago, um, I, I worked with a colleague who would bring the kids from my gifted program in from the playground and, you know, bring them in the door of my classroom and say, I can't believe a gifted kid would do something so stupid. Um, and it was a horrible thing to do and say, but it was also a reflection of not understanding that, yeah, they can talk about things in a very sophisticated and um, high level way, but they're still kids at the end of the day. They're still learning how to behave socially. They're still learning how to make choices. They're still learning how to control impulses. And so th those expectations were, were unfair potentially. Um, so uh, moving on, uh, some of the challenges, let's, let's, so kind of that kind of is, is what asynchrony is. Let's talk a little bit about what some of the challenges are that that creates. Um, so as we talked about before, your intellectual development may be ahead of academic skills, and it can also make developing academic skills more frustrating. A lot of our kids on top of this, what we've already talked about, um, are perfectionists. Uh, they weren't made perfectionist by their parents. Um, that's the proclivity that often they've had from birth. Although I have to say in my own case, I didn't really fully understand what a perfectionist I was till I started experiencing my son's perfectionism and wrestling with, you know, where that was coming from. And certainly there was certainly a genetic component to his perfectionism for sure. Um, it's, you know, again, if you can picture for example, uh, something you want to build out of your Legos, you can picture it in your head and you know exactly how you want it to look, but your hands are not able to build it yet because you aren't old enough or coordinated enough to be able to put the pieces together. That can create a real sense of stress and frustration. Um, if you are, if you can see, um, for example, in math, some of our highly gifted kids in math, they can just make these intuitive leaps and just understand where what the answer is just almost in one single leap. And if you're being asked to break that down step by step in the way that a typically developing person would get to that answer, that can be incredibly frustrating. Um, it's an important skill that we have to teach. So we have to, in working with our kids, have to give them um, you know, help them understand why that's important, but also honor the fact that they can make that leap. So for example, when I was working with kids in math, if they could just get the answer that, you know, and could justify it or explain to me in some way how they got it, that was great. I didn't have them go back and break down every single problem, but some problems they might have to show me, or they might, I might have to say, okay, you can make that leap, but for somebody who can't, how can you help them get there? And, and then make it more relevant that way. So that intellectual academic, um, difference can be challenging. 
Um, like I said before, their advanced vocabulary can make adults believe that the child is more mature than they really are. Um, so, um, you know, oftentimes our kids, I, I, I find us, myself included, getting into these intellectual conversations with our kids, trying to justify um, uh, why they're, you know, trying to help them understand maybe a problem that they need to solve, or if they've had a conflict in some ways, that we try to, to intellectually walk them through that. And while their intellectual skill is, is their superpower, and that, that is an important thing to appeal to, oftentimes it causes us to think that they're ready for greater responsibility or decision-making than they really are. Um, you know, the prime example is in is in looking for school as a, as a private school. Um, we have kids who come and tour with their families and visit and and oftentimes families will say, well, we're going to go home and uh, talk to our child and see what they want to do. And, you know, if you're only four or five or six or seven or eight years old and you've never switched schools before and you as a as a concrete thinker at that age have a hard time sort of picturing what isn't yet you live in the world of the right now to be asked to sort of think about the pros and cons of moving schools is something that's really probably developmentally you're not ready for and so kids will you know take the safe place which is no i want to stay where i am where it's comfortable where i understand things unless it's a complete disaster um and then um you know, and, and often can articulate that in a real sophisticated way. And so, so what we end up doing is giving our children sometimes more responsibility for problem solving or decision making than they're really ready for. So we have to really be paying attention and, um, and sort of mitigating, you know, how our kids, it's important to give our kids choices, but how much choice. So, you know, I want to hear what you have to say, but we're going to make this decision for you. Or um, I'm going to give you this piece of the decision, you know, so do you want this or this for dinner instead of what do you want for dinner and the whole universe is wide open. Um, so those kinds of things can be important. Um, a big piece here is the ability to cognitively understand more than the child might be emotionally ready to process. Um, many of you may have experienced your kids say having trouble when they're young watching Disney movies because they're too sad or too scary because they are intellectually and emotionally feeling that, you know, what's happening in a, in a deep, deep way um, that is beyond what you would expect for their age. So when my son was little, um, there was a movie and I can't think of the name of it off the top of my head, but it was a Disney movie. And the, the story was of a, a group of wild Mustangs and a group of Native Americans that would, you know, would capture some of them and, and tame them and they would be theirs. And it was a boy who gets his this Mustang and it becomes his and and they become very close. And, you know, it's this this um, re this wonderful relationship. And then eventually they're out riding and the Mustang um, sees and hears the herd that he came from and feels this pull to go back to his family, but also this pull to stay with his boy. And, um, and my son at, I don't know, five or six years old watched that and just became distraught with the idea that, you know, it was like a Sophie's choice moment for a six-year-old where, you know, this, this horse is, you know, it's, it has to give up something it loves either way. And how can that be? Um, that's a, a, a deeper sort of emotional sense to things than, than you would find from a typical kid that age. And so that can mean it, it might be tricky to have the news on in the car or at home. It might be tricky to have conversations about serious things at home, um, uh, it, it may mean, you know, sometimes parents, because they understand that their kids are emotionally sensitive, may try to hide things from their kids, but our kids are very perceptive and intuitive. Um, and so that can be a challenge as well. I, I knew a young man years and years ago who was a very, very bright and very intuitive young man. Um, it was about us. Well, I knew him between third and sixth grade. Um, 
And during that time, his dad was diagnosed with stomach cancer and the family knew that he was a worrier and knew that he was very sensitive. So they decided to keep it from him. The unfortunate thing was, is he was so smart and so intuitive that he figured out early on what was going on. But because the family wasn't talking to him about it, he then couldn't talk to them about it. He couldn't bring it up and let them know that he knew. So he didn't have any support in processing that. Obviously, that's an extreme example, but I think sometimes, so we, so it's a really tricky thing to navigate. How much do you share? How much do you hold back? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how you might navigate that as we go on here. Um, talked a little bit about the mismatch between cognitive ability and, and uh, physical ability. One of the things you see sometimes in, in gifted kids is this, they can think faster than they can talk. And so you get that, I call it the gifted stutter and, 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 and they just have a hard time sometimes slowing down enough to spit out what they're trying to say. Um, and so sometimes we have to just kind of say, take a second, take a deep breath, and, you know, or just let it go and just, you know, be patient with them as they try to get it out. Um, it also can mean feeling things that they don't have the words for. So having these great big feelings, these great big reactions to things and not really being able to articulate yet why that is or what's going on with them. Um, social development with gifted kids is also different from their peers. Um, you know, the, the, the myth, the, the, the common thinking about gifted kids is, you know, that they're socially behind, they're socially awkward. Um, you know, I often talk to people about, you know, don't be afraid of putting gifted kids with other gifted kids and afraid that that's just going to be the nerd factory, right? It's our kids socially are on a different trajectory, just like they are in everything else. Um, some of our kids may be socially behind. Sometimes that might be because they have other exceptionalities or other things that make it difficult for them to relate socially. Sometimes it's just because they're seeing the world, like I said, through an electron microscope in such a different way than the kids around them that they just they, it's just hard to bridge the gap. And the younger they are, the harder it is for them to navigate that big difference, you know, to try to speak a language to peers, to age peers that their age peers can understand. It can also be because some of our kids are socially ahead of the curve develop in terms of their development. There was a study done in the last 15 or so years um, around this idea. And, um, and it basically found that kids kind of go through these phases of social development where first they're playing alone. And then when they start to play with others, it's, it's a one-sided thing. My friendship with you is about what you can do for me. You can play the other parts in my imaginary story. You can make sure that I'm having a good time. You're gonna wanna do the things that I wanna do. You're gonna let me win in the game, right? And then as we get older, they start to begin to understand eventually that gift, that friendship can be reciprocal, that I have things I can do for you. You can do things you can do for me. And friendship is best when it's going two ways. For a lot of typically developing kids, that back and forth doesn't really start to happen until they're eight, nine, 10 years old. For gifted kids, that can happen as early as four or five, where they're looking for that sort of soulmate, that, that, that strong connection. And I've seen lots of times, including in my own son at Seabury, um, where kids will, will click with somebody early on, you know, as early as in our four-year-old class, will click with somebody that will continue to be a friend into adulthood because they just made a connection that was just deep and powerful and um, and important to them. Um, and so if, you know, again, if, if kids are with age peers rather than intellectual peers, they're with age peers that aren't looking for the same thing socially. And so they're trying to have a this kind of soul connection. And the other friends are just, you know, don't even realize yet that friendship can be kind of a two-way thing, don't aren't even aware of that what they're doing might impact me. Um, that can create a, a challenge. Um, also, sometimes age peers just don't relate to the intense interests of our of our kids or to our kids' sense of humor. Our kids love to play around with words. They love puns and jokes oftentimes. Um, and uh, they love complicated language. Um, and they love to, you know, if they get interested in something to not just know a little bit about it, but to know everything there is to know about it. And so um, that 
um, that again can be a barrier with other kids their age sometimes. It's why I believe on a lot of um, lists of characteristics of gifted kids, it will say that they prefer the company of adults. In my experience, they prefer the, develop the company of kids their age who get them, but those can be hard to find unless you're in a place like Seabury where they're surrounded by intellectual peers or in a gifted program um, in some other place or in a place where they've gathered with kids who have a similar interest. Um, and so they can connect around whatever that interest is, whether it be a sport or a hobby or a, um, an interest, a subject that they're interested in. Um, and then, you know, because of that difference in social development, some of our kids, and this is particularly often true for girls, although not only girls, um, they may feel the need to go underground or to mask who they truly are in order to fit in. They um, they may look around and see, okay, other kids aren't doing this, other kids aren't acting like this, so I'm going to act like everybody else. I remember when I, again, when I was teaching in the public schools, um, being in a in a middle school classroom one day as kids came into the one class in their day that was their gifted program class and literally as they walked through the door and took off their backpacks. They said, oh, here's where I can finally be me. I don't have to put on the mask and try to fit in and be like everybody else. Um, you know, we want our kids to feel comfortable in their own skin and to feel like they can truly be who they are um, and be appreciated and understood. I mean, we all have times when we have to put masks on. We all have times where we have to kind of fit in. But when our kids, particularly when they're young and they're developing their sense of self, if from an early age, and we see this in kids as young as four, where they have already figured out um, the person I need to be at school is different from who I really am if I'm really going to be successful and fit in. We had a, a, a student years ago who said uh, to uh, their parent, um, I figured out what I need to do to get my teacher to like me. I need to stop being me and I need to be who the teacher wants me to be. We don't want our kids to have that experience. We want our kids to feel like they are appreciated for who they are. And so that's what we want to try to help them navigate here. Sandy, Again, um, Mrs. Go ahead. Mrs. Moon has a little um, conversation about two of her kiddos in the classroom, if you would like her to share. Sure, go ahead, Mrs. Moon. I was just going to add the little tidbit. I'm looking in the chat about looking um, children looking for their BFF and uh, um, wanting to connect and to echo what you were sharing, that Seabury is this place where we're these intellectual dynamos at age four find their peers. And the other day I had two uh, children working just with the marble run and one child, uh, I could overhear one of the, ch uh, one of the kids saying to the other child, uh, hand me a white blood cell. And the other child without missing a beat, here you go. And handing that child the white blood cell, they were working on two different projects, but one was, the lungs, uh, heart, and the upper part of basically the respiratory system using the marble run. And the other one separately was working on um, the digestive track. And you, you could really look at these two models and see what they were working on pretty accurately, but the way they could communicate with each other, I need a white blood cell and, and sharing that. I just, that's one of the things I love about Seabury is these kids come in and um, in a program like this, and they find their people, they find their peers. It's yeah. pretty cool. For sure. Thanks for sharing that. That's a great story. That's absolutely. Anybody else at this point, questions or thoughts or comments? Um, let's see. Let's go back here because we don't want to skip this one. I think one of the things that can happen with this tension that can happen or these, you know, this being out of sync that we're talking about here is that it can mean that our kids struggle with emotional regulation. They tend to have big, intense feelings anyway. We'll talk a lot more about that at, at the intensity talk. Um, they tend to feel things and experience things in an intense way as some of those definitions we're talking about. And and at the same time, again, if they're developmentally not a place where they have learned how to regulate their feelings, those um, frustrations, those challenges can come out in a big way. They can uh, often intellectually sit there and tell you, 
how they should handle it when they're frustrated. But in the moment when the frustration happens, may not yet have the maturity to be able to regulate themselves. And so you may see meltdowns or shutting down. In older kids, what you may see is, is existential angst, which tends to be really high in the gifted community, um, particularly in adolescence, um, where they start to to ask these big questions, you know, we see it in our kids as we talk about, say, climate change. Um, you know, if the world is burning up anyway, what's the point? Why do I even? Why do I even? You know, try. Why does it matter if I go to school? We're all going to burn up anyway. You know, this sort of um, these big feelings of worry and and fear and frustration and helplessness and what can I do can really turn into depression and angst and and um, and real struggles if the kids don't have the support and the, um, and the tools to be able to manage those big feelings. Um, and vulnerability, you saw that in a couple of the definitions. They can be, it, it creates a vulnerability to their own big feelings, to their own frustrations and, and challenges, um, and also a, a vulnerability with others. It can make them a target if, if they're not well understood. You know, we we talk at at Seabury oftentimes about I think one of the things we see with our kids when they go off from Seabury into high school and beyond is that they've developed a sense of self-confidence from being around people who get them and appreciate them and see them, see their strengths and and really build on their strengths. Um, they take that then into the world when they leave Seabury um, and it helps them take take those things that make them sort of quirky and make it work for them. And so their their quirkiness is seen as what makes them interesting instead of what makes them odd or weird or ostracized. Um, for a lot of gifted kids out there, if they've not ever been around anybody like them, if they've never met another kid who needs to know everything about the solar system or dinosaurs or whatever it might be like they do, um, if they, they they can feel very isolated and alone and like they're the only person. Um, and, and can become a target for others who, you know, who don't get them and, you know, don't appreciate them. But, but if they, if they can develop a sense of self-confidence, a sense of like, I feel good about who I am and what I am. And if, you know, I, I had a student one time years ago who said, I'm an awesome person. And if other people don't appreciate that, then that's their loss. You know, that's the kind of attitude we want our kids not to be arrogant, but to go out there feeling good enough about themselves that they can find those people that are their people and um, and find a community that supports and, and cares for them. Um, one last thing in terms of challenges before we get to sort of what do we do about it is um, we we in in our in in terms of gifted education we talk about kids who are gifted and have some other learning difference as being twice exceptional so a student who's gifted and has a, a learning disability um you know may have dyslexia auditory processing disorder visual processing disorder um is a 2e kid a kid who is gifted and on the autism spectrum or gifted and has adhd or any other number of things that can be a learning difference. Um, so they have that even exacerbates the strengths and weaknesses and that exacerbates the asynchrony. Um, the One of the challenges is it can be sometimes hard to figure out what the disability is because their giftedness can allow them to mask it. There are lots of kids, they, uh, we talk about stealth dyslexia. There's lots of kids out there who have dyslexia or, or a reading disability um, a learning disability related to reading and, and language um, that oftentimes doesn't get diagnosed until third or fourth or fifth or sixth grade, because up until then, they're able to sort of mask what's going on with them. They're able to cope and keep up enough that they don't, you don't see that discrepancy. And then suddenly as other kids start to really take off in reading and they're not doing that, we can start to see that maybe there's some processing thing going on that we need to pay attention to. Um, and, and same with sort of quirky behaviors, we can see that. So, um, and, and then those, those other exceptionalities can also sometimes make it harder to see the kids' strengths. So we, we, we always wanna pay attention to kids' strengths and always wanna try to use their strengths to address their, their weaknesses as much as we can. So the big question that you're probably here to really think about, talk about is, so what do I do to support my 
asynchronous child. So I have a number of suggestions just from my 35 years of working with these kids and raising one and being one of these kids myself um, as I was growing up. I think the first thing that for me is that behavior is communication. Whether you're seeing um, you know, behaviors that you're happy about or behaviors that are challenging, um, the way your kid's responding to you, to school, to others, can be telling you things that, uh, that are important to pay attention to. So one of the things that it can communicate is the developmental age or stage you're dealing with. So if a child is having a meltdown at the end of the day, um, it, it could be that developmentally, physically, you know, they're just, they're younger than intellectually they seem like, and they are just out of gas and they, you know, need an earlier bedtime or they, you know, despite their ability to negotiate with you otherwise, um, or maybe they've been given too many choices and they're overwhelmed with the amount of choice and they need somebody to, to, lessen the number of choices that they have, not to take them away entirely, but like I said before, instead of what do you want for dinner? Do you want this or this? You know, do you want to go to this school or tell me how you feel about this so we can make a decision and understand what you're thinking about that. So those kinds of things. Um, don't let their advanced verbal ability fool you. We talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, just because they can talk like an adult doesn't mean that they are an adult. Um, and so pay attention to the, to the other cues that can tell you what age or stage you're dealing with in a particular situation. It may be that in some situations, they really can operate at a much higher level. Um, you know, if they're having an intellectual discussion about the pros and cons of, you know, whatever, or the intricacies of Pokemon cards or whatever, they can operate at a high level. But when it comes to whether or not they should have a later bedtime or how they're going to work out a disagreement with a sibling or a friend, that you may see more of the younger end of their emotional development. And you may need to make decisions more like you would based on their age as opposed to their intellectual ability. And be asking yourself, if, if you find yourself getting frustrated with your child, ask yourself if you are asking more than the child is developmentally ready for. A really good example of that is when we came back from COVID, um, I found myself after the first couple of weeks of school at our middle school, um, being just really frustrated at the end of the days I spent there. Um, I had, our middle school is on two levels and, um, and I had been there, I was working on the downstairs level where the social studies humanities teacher taught. And, and, and this had happened multiple times before in that particular day though, when it caught my attention, the teacher had brought the kids in um, to get ready for social studies class. And he said, take out your computers and take out a piece of paper and a pencil. And none of the kids had either with them. And, and, and he had to send the whole group back upstairs to get the things that they needed for that class. And I was just like, what, what is with these kids? You know? Um, and again, I've worked with gifted kids for a long time. I know executive function can be behind with our kids, but come on, this is ridiculous. Um, and then it occurred to me that those kids who were sixth graders that year, when we had, were first back in school after the pandemic, the last time they had been in a classroom in person um, was when they were in third grade. A third grade teacher wouldn't say, get your stuff for social studies, and we're going to start social studies class. A third grade teacher would say, get your computer, get your pencil, get your pen, get your paper. You know, they would, they would give very specific instructions about what they needed. These kids had missed those couple of years when they would have been developing that greater independence and being able to think those things through for themselves. So developmentally, in terms of their executive function, they were behind where even our, you know, our typical gifted sixth graders would be. Um, and so our teachers, and it wasn't just in sixth grade, it was in every grade level, our teachers had to really recalibrate their expectations for their kids in terms of their ability to be independent and manage their time and even to work with others because they had lost, you know, a couple of years of being able to do that. Um, and even without a pandemic, we see those kinds of differences. So be, you know, asking yourself, like, if I'm seeing behavior that's making, you know, that, that I'm not happy with, does, could it be that I'm asking developmentally more of my child than they're really ready for? 
Um, I mentioned, uh, again, executive function. So one of the things that we've learned in recent years through the kind of uh, Im brain imaging that we can do now is, um, is, a, is an interesting phenomenon with gifted kids. So we know in terms of brain development that up until about, in most kids, about 10 years old, the brain is growing neural connections. They're just making more and more and more connections. And, and those connections expand the ability to, to understand and retain information, make connections and all of those things. Starting at about age 10, for most people, two things start to happen. All of those connections start to the, the growth of connections sort of slows down. And what happens is the brain goes through this pruning process. So connections that aren't being used get pruned away so that connections that are being used can be strengthened. At the same time, the frontal lobe where executive function resides starts to begin to be formed. So the so kids start to grow in their ability to anticipate what's gonna, you know, consequences to um, organize, to manage their time, to, um, you know, self-care, all of those kinds of things start to grow. What we found with gifted kids is that that process is delayed and that sometimes it's not until they're 13, 14, 15 years old before that pruning process and that development of executive function starts to happen. Um, and so the result of that is one, they're growing those neural connections for a longer period of time. So their, their sort of ability to grow their brain lasts longer, but at the same time, their executive function is delayed. So at our middle school, if you know me, you've heard me say a million times, you know, our kids say on their computers can do coding that's super sophisticated, but we have to tell them every single solitary day, when you go to plug in your computer, don't plug it in across a walkway where you're going to trip people or don't leave your open computer on the floor where people are walking. I mean, things that just seem so obvious. Um, I read a, a quote from a parent of a gifted child with time who said, you, you just, you never know when they're going to start thinking and when they're going to stop, you know, they're, they're, they're going to make, uh, you know, connections sometimes that are just blow your mind. But then other times you just think, how could you not see this or how could you not do this? And that's because that executive function can be delayed. So we need to kind of scaffold for our kids. Doesn't mean that we say, okay, you got to pass your smart kids so you don't have to manage your time or your materials. It just may mean that we need to do more support or we need to back up and say, you know, I'm going to give you the list of things that you need to do before you get ready for bed or the list of things you need to do to get ready for school in the morning um, before just saying get ready for school or, or those kinds of things. Um, taking that as sort of simple things and breaking them down for our kids. Um, you wanna pay attention to the difference between your child's ability to debate or negotiate and the maturity of their reasoning. So our kids typically love to debate. They love to negotiate. In fact, when I hire a new teacher, typically one of the first things I tell them is when, if you haven't worked with gifted kids before, the, the most important thing you can know when you walk into your classroom is what's negotiable and what's not in any given lesson on any given day. Our kids are so curious and they're so filled with questions that just, you know, the simple, um, statement, take out a pencil can derail your day with, you know, what kind of pencil does it have to have an eraser? Does it have to be a colored pencil? Could it be a, you know, could it be a pen? Could it be a marker? You could end up spending the whole day on just that. If you allow everything to be negotiable, um, our kids love to be able to negotiate. They love to be able to debate and they love to make things as complicated as possible. Um, we play Foursquare at school. We love Foursquare at school because it lends itself to be complicated. We also hate Foursquare at school because it it's becomes a, a reason to argue and debate and go back and forth about your rules or my rules or my interpretation of the rules. We, at times in our Foursquare games, have had a judge and then a judge of the judge and then a judge of the judge of the judge. Um, we... Uh, our, our Dean of Student Story, Hale, when I when I um, hired her last year, one of the first things she was she laughed about, uh, she went out on the playground and by the force where somebody had had put a sign on the fence that had the word bias with the circle and the line through it because they were just in, you know, the sense of justice and ethics is also really powerful in a lot of our kids, but that desire to negotiate is really big. If we give in to that 
And again, let everything be negotiable. And our kids can be relentless about that. Again, oftentimes we can give ourselves more responsibility for decision-making than they're really ready for. When what they really need to feel safe and secure is boundaries. Um, so limited choices that are more aligned to their age readiness. One of the things I also found, you know, in working with older gifted kids is that if you stop and sort of listen, when, when you've got a, a child who's negotiating or debating with you about something and they can be relentless and they can be amazing debaters, you know, and just not let anything slip. Um, but if you start to listen to the reasoning behind what they're debating, it can be, you know, not as mature, you know, it can be really like, I just want to have my way <laughs> or, um, you know, you're not, you know, that you're not listening to me. You're not hearing me. I don't feel heard can really be a more, you know, a less mature sort of, um, listening equals getting my way. And if I'm not getting my way, then you're not listening when in fact you really are listening. You're just saying no, um, or it's not fair can translate to I'm not winning. You know, that's a sort of a more childish view of fairness. And as you get older, your idea of fairness sort of expands and grows. And so for a lot of our kids, when they're young, um, they can sound again, their arguments can sound more sophisticated than they really are. Um, and so look at that and that can give you a, an ind indication of whether, you know, the boundaries need to be um, kind of reined in or whether the amount of choices that you're giving kids needs to be limited. Um, um, I think it's important to note, and sometimes parents of gifted kids get nervous about this, that our kids will find ways to sort of feed the ages and stages that they are. And that's good. Uh, like we, it often comes up in terms of reading choices. Parents will, you know, their child might be a really er, an early reader and a really good reader. And the parent will come to us and be frustrated because they're capable of reading this complicated stuff. And yet they keep checking out Captain Underpants over and over again, or some, you know, sparkle fairy, whatever, um, you know, simple, simple book. Um, and I always liken it to as an adult, you know, sometimes you choose to read things that you can learn from and that challenge you. And sometimes you just want the beach novel, you know, that just lets you just rest and is predictable and, you know, just fun. And our kids are no different. Um, sometimes they need to feed the six-year-old if they're six and, and sometimes they need to feed the 10 year old brain and that's okay. In fact, that's a pretty healthy choice for our kids to make. Um, we also find um, some of our kids use books um, or stories to, to help kind of figure the world out. Um, again, you can imagine if your intellectual ability is, is different from your age, you may find yourself being able to read things that you don't have the life experience or the maturity to be able to really fully ex understand. Um, I remember trying to read Junie B. Jones books. If you remember those books about a little girl in kindergarten and silly things that happened to her. I tried reading that to my son when he was, when he hadn't been to school yet. And, um, and he wasn't laughing. He wasn't finding it funny because he didn't have any life experience to that. None of those stories made sense to him. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the, you know, what your kids bring to the table in terms of their understanding. Um, it's why oftentimes our kids reread books over and over again, too. Um, it, it, some of our kids, you know, want to take on Harry Potter at a young age um, and and they'll read it because they love the story and they love the magic, but they'll revisit it when they get a little bit older. And even sometimes as adults, because there's so much more depth and so much more um, meat to it than they might recognize when they're young. Um, and so each time they come back to it, they're sort of taking something different away for it. We also, you know, can see kids kind of swinging back and forth between seeming very mature and and beyond their age and then just being silly or talking baby talk or just sort of losing it and and that's that's very normal they you know that's feeding the different ages um we talked a little bit about this idea of heightened sensitivity um it's really important to do the best you can to kind of be aware of what your kids are seeing and hearing that's hard in this age of phones and 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 devices 
Um, our kids are seeing a world that we often are shocked at what they're coming across. It's and it's hard to manage that. Um, but um, keeping lines of communication open, paying attention if your child starts to seem like they're struggling with things, and make and being a safe space for them to talk to you about things that they see that might be bothering them, uh, might be disturbing them is is really important. Um, one of the temptations for us when our kids are bright and they're highly verbal is, is to give them more information than they're really asking for. Um, and, uh, and so when a child asks a question like, where do babies come from? Or, you know, why did, did grandma die from cancer? But my friend's grandma got better when they had cancer. Um, it, those, especially when we get those questions that make us uncomfortable, and especially when we've got young kids, um, sometimes we can, again, think of them in terms of, of the their intellectual, their verbal ability, and give them really more information than they're asking for. And so I always advocate for sort of starting simple, you know, I know it doesn't seem fair, and sometimes things just uh, happen like that, and we can't really ever fully understand why and stop there. And that may be enough. And if the child needs more, they're going to ask for more. And then you can kind of go farther with that. Um, it's really important to affirm that kids' feelings are real. A lot of our kids in settings where they're not well understood get told, stop being so emotional. Stop making such a big deal about it. Stop being, you know, so, oh, it's not that, you know, it's not that big a thing. Um, affirm that I can see that you're having really big feelings about this and I can see that it's really bothering you. What can I do to help you manage those big feelings? Um, or what can you do to help yourself being able to work through those big feelings? Um, sensitivity, I think it's worth mentioning, can also um, be physical sensitivity. A lot of our kids can't stand scratchy clothes or tags in their clothes or the seam in their sock being so seam in their sock being sideways. Um, there's for whatever reason, there's a high the higher the IQ, the higher the incidence in, of allergies, particularly food allergies. We don't know why, but it's it's something that they've shown in in multiple studies. Um, lots of picky eaters. Um, some of our kids, it's because they actually have heightened sensory awareness. There are kids uh, who are super tasters, for example, that have like 10,000 taste buds for every one that a typical person would have. So they're tasting things in a way that the rest of us aren't. Um, so um, that can be the case. It can also just be texture or, um, you know, again, just their, if you imagine that their bodies are just tuned to take in information. Um, and sometimes that's more information that we want them to take in uh, or then is comfortable for them to take in. And so helping them navigate that is important. So just being aware of that is, is the first step and then helping them have the, the um, tools to navigate that is really important. Um, I always like to mention when I talk about food and gifted kids that again, research has found that um, the biggest consumer of glucose in our bodies are brains. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that gifted people, not just kids, but gifted people whose brains are going a thousand miles an hour consume a lot of energy to have that happen. There's a high incidence in gifted people, again, not just kids, but people, and something called reactive hypoglycemia. Um, and that's where you get that you have breakfast, you get that surge of energy, you're feeling good, and then you get that sort of late morning crash and then you have lunch and you feel good again. And then you have that afternoon crash. We see it at school. I literally have seen kids at school where they start to have a meltdown. We had a student a number of years ago would start to get frustrated with something, start to have a meltdown. Um, for him, the, the protein of choice was peanut butter. We'd hand him a spoonful of peanut butter. And before he could even get that all consumed, his attitude would have changed. Uh, so that's something to watch for in your own child. If you find that there are times when they're having more trouble emotionally regulating, look and see whether they might be hungry. And then look and see too, um, if they're eating a lot of simple carbs that you know give a big burst of glucose and then, and then a drop off, look and see whether um, protein, like protein for breakfast, protein for lunch, 
that gives a more sustained energy flow can help get rid of some of those ups and downs. So I think that's something that's always worth knowing about our kids. We've talked a lot about emotional regulation. Um, you know, that the, I think two other things that I haven't mentioned yet that I think are important to know is that oftentimes our kids can intellectually understand what to do before they can actually do it. So they can sit and tell you, oh, yes, when I get mad at my brother, I should take a deep breath and use my words and explain to my brother why I'm mad um, and not hit him. And they can they can flawlessly tell you exactly what they should do. And then in the moment may not yet have the maturity, the emotional regulation to be able to actually do that. Um, obviously you wanna work towards that, but for some kids, they it has to start with the intellectual, that's their superpower. And and if the if they're saying it, but they can't do it, it's it's probably not that they don't want to do it or they don't care about doing it. It's probably that they haven't been able to catch themselves. So giving them the tools I always talk to kids about putting space between the action and the reaction. So when your brother does something that makes you mad, what can you do to put space between that thing and how you react to that? Because if you react right away, you're more likely to have what we what we talk to kids about as an amygdala response, a fight or flight response. That little bitty reptile brain is in charge and it doesn't think very well. But if you can take a little, a deep breath or count to 10 or put some space in between your big thinking brain um, that's really good at problem solving can come up with all kinds of ways to let your brother know that you're mad and solve the problem with them. And it's gonna be much less likely that you're gonna hurt him or he's gonna hurt you or you're gonna get yourself in trouble. So. Um, using that intellectual ability, but but remembering that the emotional regulation can come later, I think is important. Um, we at Seabury do a lot of also teaching of skills for self-regulation, mindfulness, um, breathing, uh, you know, how to how to take deep breaths, how to, um, you know, for some kids it's it's textures can be soothing or um, things to fidget with or whatever, those can things. So helping kids discover what things help them emotionally regulate when they're feeling that that sense of tension. Physical movement for some kids. Some of our kids sit in wiggle seats or um, like to lay on the floor or whatever, sometimes laying on their stomach on the floor and doing work. That pressure against their, their body can actually help them emotionally regulate. Journaling and reflecting for some of our kids can be really helpful. Um, uh, I've got a couple more, but before I do that, let me just stop there because I've just thrown a lot at you. Questions or comments that have come up? It looks like maybe there's... Um, no questions yet. Just kind of some little comments popping up in the chat. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, the other thing I want to say about emotional regulation is if you've got a child who really struggles with emotional regulation... Um, it, it could be just, again, because the, the degree of asynchrony is great, you know, that the difference between their physical age and their mental age is so great that that they just, it, it's just too much to manage on their own. In other cases, it can be that there's some other exceptionality at play, some maybe undiagnosed um, learning difference or or something else going on that can, that is adding to that. And so, in that case, I, I really encourage you to seek outside support. Um, occupational therapy can be a great uh, way to help kids learn to self-regulate. We have a lot of kids that we, we refer to occupational therapy. Some have our 2 e and have other disabilities. Other kids are just gifted. To be gifted is to be neurodiverse. And, and to be neurodiverse means that you, you know, there these challenges that we're talking about tonight can are, are for real. And so sometimes some outside help can can be important. Um, you know, some of our kids who are just incredibly empathetic and who just feel for the whole world all the time, that's a heavy burden. I mean, it's wonderful to have a kind and empathetic person, but if that person is feeling the pain of everybody around them all the time, um, that's huge. And then when you add to that, you know, that you might be five or six or seven or eight years old, um, or 10 or 12 or 14 years old, that can be a lot to deal with. And so, um, you know, getting some outside support, finding a counselor that they can talk to um, can be helpful. I think it's 
for some of our kids, um, therapy is going to be part of their lives for them to be able to be help, you know, healthy and destigmatizing that early on and seeing the value of having somebody who's not your parent and not your teacher, just a, a truly neutral person who can help you sort of just talk through and work through some of those big feelings and that um, those things that you're struggling with can be really important. So um, I really encourage families to to think about whether that might be something that you might want to do. And we at school can certainly help you with finding resources or determining whether that might be something that might be helpful for your child. Um, and then it's really important for you as a parent or a teacher to, to find peers for yourself as well. Um, you want intellectual peers for your child for the reasons that we've talked about earlier. Um, uh, but you also, I think it's important to find other adults for you that can share sort of both the joys and the challenging of raising these kids. They are not easy. Um, they, you know, they're, we love working with our kids. Um, they teach us more than we feel like we could ever teach them. Um, they just blow our minds with, with um, their insights and their creativity and their sensitivity and all those things every single day. But they are also a lot. And having somebody who you can talk to, and I think as a parent, sometimes some of the things that you struggle with raising a gifted child, if you talk to a, a parent of, of a more typically developing kid, you know, it may, they may not be able to relate or it may come across you know, you may feel like that, that they think that you're sort of bragging, you know, you know, what am I going to do to find reading material for my five-year-old who's reading, you know, chapter books? Um, you know, not all parents are sort of open to hearing that as a problem, but it is a problem. And, and, you know, parents of other gifted kids can really relate to that. And one of the things I found over the years at Seabury is, um, is the value of parents connecting with other parents. Um, and, and I've also seen, you know, in the admissions process um, from so, you know, so many parents, maybe some of you here that, you know, talking, talking with us about your child might be the first time you've heard that there are other kids that are like yours, you know, might not be only your child who doesn't know that there's other kids like them out there, but might be you aren't, you know, haven't come across other kids like yours. And once you start to find that there are other kids that can sort of validate your experience as a parent and can really help you have resources and being able to support your child and, and take good care of yourself. Um, and then obviously you want teachers that, that get your child. So if you're not, you know, at Seabury, if you're in a, in a, a program, you always want to look for people who can uh, see your kids strengths for strengths and not look at them as, as weaknesses, um, and really use their strengths to address their, their areas of weakness. A couple of resources to share, um, SANG Gifted, SANG stands for Supporting the Emotional Needs of the Gifted. Their website is uh, sanggifted.org. It's a great resource. It's all about social emotional needs of gifted kids. You can find lots of things about asynchrony there. So I really encourage you to look there if that's something that's of interest to you. Hokies Gifted is another website that's kind of everything about gifted ed. There's a section for parents, a section for educators, a section for kids, tons of resources on all kinds of things, school, home, all the things. And then the book that is, that's probably the best thing out there around asynchrony and the gifted child, if you want to really dig deeper into this is a book called Off the Charts, Asynchrony and the Gifted by Stephanie Tolan. They have it on, uh, on Amazon. Um, I have a copy in my office if you ever want to take a look at it, but it's, um, it's a great resource if you want to know more about this. So with that, um, I hope that you've taken something out of this that's helpful. Are there any questions before we end tonight? None in the chat, but if anybody wants to unmute, they are welcome to ask. If not, thank you for being here. My apologies again for getting started uh, a little bit late. Um, and uh, we will have this recording of this available. So if you want to share this with others, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, thanks for taking time tonight. And uh, if we can be a resource for you and your family, uh, that's what we're here for. So please reach out to us, to me, to teachers, to um, uh, Ms. Hale, our Dean of Students. We are here to help. So thanks again so much. Have a great evening and uh, hope to see you soon.
you can stop recording, Emily.